five. Good evening, friends. I'll be on camera with you in just a moment. Seems like, yeah, I get the buttons still working. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to the Friday night, Sabbath Eve Bible study here on COGTV.org. We're streaming live on Facebook Live's Sabbath service page. And uh, as I mentioned on the recording, this a recording of this will be in the archive later. On the Hebrew calendar, friends, it's the 20th day of the 11th month on God's Holy Sacred Calendar. Did I say it's the 25th day of January 2019 on the pagan Roman calendar? Friday night, as the world calls it, but since sunset, it's been the Sabbath. And after we go to bed tonight, have a good night's sleep, hopefully, awake in the morning, it'll still be the Sabbath, and it'll still be the 20th day of the 11th month on God's sacred calendar. In the morning, though, on the pagan Roman calendar, instead of being the 25th of January, as it is tonight, it'll be the 26th day of January, 2019, the way man changes the day, a kooky time at midnight. But on the, on the God's calendar, on the sacred calendar, the Hebrew calendar, this year is a leap year. So if you're counting down on the Hebrew calendar, to the next feast day, which is the Passover, after sunset, when the 14th of the first month begins. Uh, we're looking at 10 more days, 9, 10 more days in the 11th month, all of the 12th month, all of the 13th month this year, Adar 1, Adar 2. Then the new year begins on the first day of the first month of the sacred calendar, and 14 days into that, Passover. So we've got two full months, two weeks, plus 10 days. So we have just a little bit shy of three months. We're still almost three months away from the next feast day. Not a holy day, a feast day. Most solemn feast day of the whole year, very important one. The only feast day that God has a repeat, a makeup for 30 days later if you miss for a legitimate reason, the first Passover of the year, the Passover foot washing ceremony, memorial, then on the 14th day of the second month, there's a second Passover. But now if you keep the first Passover, you do not also go keep the second Passover. That's just a makeup for those who had a leg legitimate reason for missing the first Passover. And you, you try to not miss something that important. Talk about important, we had important news this week, and there are several things that I was reviewing before coming on, and as I was praying and asking God what I should do tonight, as I always do before the live streams, I ask Him to help me with them, and when I open my, my mouth, my lips, that God inspire and speak through me, and you can ask Him the same thing, both to inspire not only my speaking, but your hearing. And when you do that, there are certain things God may open up in your mind based on what he has me say that's different for you than it is for someone else because of the dynamics in your life between you and the Father and Jesus Christ being our intercessor. 
for us. When he hears you praying in his name, in his authority, to our Father by having paid the price of our being cut off from God by his blood and the stripes that he took for us, uh, we can, we can are, and are instructed to speak directly to the Father, make our petitions, our prayers, our thanksgiving directly to the Father. And Jesus Christ is right there, and oftentimes he may speak up and say, yeah, that's good, let, you know, that's good. And uh, if he's asking for forgiveness on this or that, uh, let me speak up for him. I was tested in that. That's a tough thing he went through. He's sorry he did it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. Let's forgive him. Father, let's help him. I'll help him. And the Father says, yeah, okay, let's, good, good, let's do, let's do forgive him. Let's hope he makes it. It's the Father's will that none perish. And their focus is on the spring harvest because judgment is on the spring harvest, those who are called now. Uh, the fall harvest, the great fall harvest, they can goof up. They're going to have their judgment later and can ask forgiveness and be forgiven. But the spring harvest, God has put himself on the hook with us. He's called the, uh, us to a first or third. Now, if you grew up in the church, you, you actually have a first or second. Now, if you choose first, then you eliminate the second, and it's first or third. Um, but if you don't choose the first, it's only second or third for you. And the second resurrection, yeah, it's, that's good, but that's the great big fall harvest. But it says in Revelation that the first resurrection is a blessed resurrection. It actually makes a distinction that if you have the option for the first resurrection, you have an option for a better resurrection. Smaller, better, more elite. Talk about it. elite. We're called the elect, but that elect is the elite of the kingdom of God. And it's the only, it's only those of the first resurrection who have the opportunity to marry Jesus Christ and become part of the brideship to Jesus Christ, his wife. The fall harvest comes into the kingdom simply as children. And still part of the family, they still live forever, still, and still part of the God family with flesh transformed into spirit, mortal to immortality, corruption into incorruption. But uh, it's, you know, but there's a whole different, it's, and it's still family, but they're children and not part of the brideship. And that being part of the brideship is, makes it a very, very special calling. So a small pitch to those of you who grew up in the church who, who are not cut off from God like the rest of the world is, and so you, you've had access to the truth, and yet as God expounded and explained and revealed through his end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong to us, you have to make a choice for it. You have to tell God, hey, I want this first resurrection that I have an option for. And if you don't, you let it just pass by and slip by, and God will say, okay, you know, you, you didn't ask for it. You could have had it. Uh, so as the rest of the world goes, you, you'll have your option in the second resurrection. And some church kids are happy with that. So, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and so they don't get the understanding that, those who God actually does call and choose to be part of the first resurrection have, and they don't have the opportunity that those called to the first resurrection have. A most blessed opportunity, again, to be married to Jesus Christ, to reign and rule with Christ through the thousand years, and essentially a thousand-year head start in eternity. And even though eternity is, you know, spirit and forever, eternal, you know, different from the Father in Christ who always existed, everybody else, even the angels who are now eternal, had a beginning when they were created. They're created beings, even the angels. And us, who, born of the flesh that started with Adam and Eve, 
you know, there's that joke about, well, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? <laughs> and, and since they were made from the flesh of the earth, you know, just for design purposes, God could have, in his humor or whatever, could have put one there. But the jokes go as if, as if Adam and Eve did not have a belly button because neither of them were born. Adam himself was made of the dust of the earth, and Eve, after God put Adam to sleep, was made from one of the ribs of Adam. There, there's a, a fabulous joke. Why don't I, to warm it up, I'll start with a joke my dad used to tell, and then we'll get to one of the news stories from this week that was like, wham, bam, boom, hello. And I have that uh, email from Paul Kiefer, who lives in Germany, who wrote to me yesterday after the news story, and I, I had written him about it, and he responded to me about the news story on the French president Emmanuel Macron and the German chancellor Angela Merkel embracing, as you see here, after they signed a formal Franco-German alliance. The first formal Franco-German alliance in 56 years. And in fact, they did it on the anniversary date on the Roman calendar, exactly 56 years from a former formal Franco-German alliance. But uh, we'll come to that in a moment. I, I, I said we'll tell you this little joke first about Adam and Eve. Eve being made from Adam's rib. Uh, Adam comes home from he just he comes home late one night, you know, he's been out all day. And you know, whatever he did out there in the garden and what have you, Eve was at home preparing meals and Adam comes in late after sunset and Eve is all upset. The meal is cold and she's a little bit suspect about what Adam's been up to. And she asks Adam, Adam, have you been out with another woman? And Adam says to Eve, honey, you know, you know, you're the only woman in the world. God made you from one of my ribs. And so they sit down to a cold and quiet dinner that night. Eve, well, she kind of heard that, but she's still just, she's still, still just wondering about Adam and why he really is home so late and what he had been out doing. Well, Adam tucks on in, goes to bed, and next thing you know, Adam is being rustled over by Eve on top of him, poking around on him. And he says, honey, honey, what are you doing? She said, I'm counting your ribs. So I guess, you know, she, yeah, don't explain it, Steve. You blow the joke. All right, my dad used to tell that. I think he probably would tell it a lot better than I do, but my dad died 10 years ago 2000, in 2008, and uh, I still remember my dad telling that joke. He told another one, too, that related to Adam and Eve. It's a short quickie. Uh, he, uh, Adam and Eve have had their sons, and they've been thrown out of the Garden of Eden, you know, and Adam is walking alongside. Now, now the angels have gone, and God's put up great big iron gates all around the Garden of Eden. And Adam's walking on the sidewalk outside there, outside the big iron gates and with his boys. And the boys look up and see this beautiful mansion inside at the Garden of Eden. And they say, Dad, look at that. Who lives there? And Adam says to his sons, Well, sons, we used to until your mom ate us out of house and home. That's another one of my dad jokes. Again, he probably tells that a whole lot better than I do, of course. You know, maybe what I should do is what some of these comedians do is get yourself one of them laugh buttons, you know, and you just push the button and have laughter roll in. I don't have anybody in the in the studio here with me tonight. But, you know, maybe you got some light humor out of those two of my dad's favorite jokes. Um, but on a more serious note now, on this very serious story this week, uh, we'll make some comments about that, and I'll read Paul Kiefer's email to you. And I'm going to make it a, I'm going to try and make it, unless God answers my prayer about, you know, inspiring me what to say with a lot of things. I'm going to try and make it a short evening tonight. And normally where I would 
play uh, one of the tapes of Mr. Armstrong speaking. I'm going to pass on that tonight, and I'll tell you why in a moment. You know, and of course, and if you want to hear Mr. Armstrong, there's plenty of stuff you can Google or Bing for all over the Internet. Now, I try to play one so that we're all on the same page together. Um, but after my talk tonight, I, I want to, you know, wrap it up. We're going to be in the morning for the Sabbath service picking up where we left off last week with... Uh, I didn't do so hot a job on the first few chapters while we were reading the United States and Britain in Prophecy when I read it the first time maybe six or eight months ago. So I'm redoing the first few chapters, and we will pick up with Chapter 3 of United States and Britain in Prophecy in the morning. reason for that is some of the last programs, telecasts we played with Mr. Armstrong speaking in sermon excerpts that were put onto his World Tomorrow telecast program. He really was pitching for people, even, you know, in brethren. He was speaking in a, uh, before an audience of brethren, in one case, even at the Feast of Tabernacles, pitching for us to be sure we're familiar with and have recently read the book he wrote entitled The United States and Britain and Prophecy. And especially important to understand the symbols in that book today with today's news the way it is. So we'll be picking up on that in the morning with the Sabbath service. Um, but tonight, what we're going to do before we uh, cover a subject on what is the EU, I'm going to cover that a little bit tonight. I'm first going to, we're going to back up to uh, the news story from this week, the prominent news story on the Franco, the formal Franco-German alliance. Now, if you missed the news Tuesday night and Wednesday night, this occurred on Tuesday this week when the formal Franco-German alliance signing was made between France and Germany, between France, France's leader, the president, Emmanuel Macron, and the German chancellor, one of the leaders. They also have a president, but she, she's mainly like the prime minister of a country who kind of runs the everyday affairs of the country, a German chancellor, Angela Merkel, having made this agreement that wound up with them being photographed in an embrace that, like I was joking earlier this week, uh, could be a front cover of a novel, of a, of a romantic novel. The Franco-German affair, maybe, you know. As I was kind of joking last night and suggesting that one of you uh, who works in a library and does screenplays should maybe consider writing a novel. The Franco-German affair. P put plenty of prophecy in the novel and, you know, cover it, make it as realistic to what we could likely see happening as a result of this. And there in the goals that were announced, if you didn't, see the news stories Tuesday and Wednesday night this week. They are in the archive on the worldwatch.tv page. Uh, you can find a link to that on our main webpage, cogtv.org. You can see it on the lower third in the lower corner over, the, over here on the right side of the screen at the bottom, cogtv.org. Just select the menu tab from the right side of the screen that says archive video and then select the dates for Tuesday and Wednesday night. You can see the full story on this um, signing of a Franco-German alliance between France, Germany, and all the goal, goals that they have and the ramifications of it as well with some of the members of the EU, some of the other members other than France and Germany, uh, announcing upset over France and Germany having done this, calling for reminders that, look, these aren't, the EU is more than just France and Germany. You know, there's 25 others of us beside you in this union after, after the UK leaves 25 others, if in fact the, the UK winds up leaving, uh, Brexiting. But uh, in response to the news on this, as I said, I wrote Paul Kiefer about it. Paul wrote me back and said, uh, Steve, hi, Steve, the interest in having 
an EU army. Now, that was one of the uh, things that happened that you'll see if you watch the news story or if you watched and heard it already. Mrs. Merkel twice on Tuesday after their signing made calls for a European army to be a part of their Franco-German alliance and for it to be part of the EU, to, for the EU to have its own army. And Paul wrote me back from Germany and said, the interest in having an EU army has grown since 2017. He says since January 20, since January 20, 2017, the date of President Trump's inauguration with, with the uncertainty over the views about the NATO alliance and the future of, of the alliance, of the NATO alliance. Paul says, after a NATO summit meeting in 2017, Chancellor Merkel said that the days of days when Europe could unconditionally rely on the United States were over. And Paul adds, during the 1999 bombing of Serbia, which Paul says was a NATO action, he said the United States refused to share certain intelligence on the situation with European NATO partners. Now, if you remember and recall 1999, those were the days of uh, former President uh, Bill Clinton and several news stories from 1999 point out that, well, with uh, Mr. Clinton under a, uh, what did they call that, a Monica Gate scandal type situation to take the daily focus off of, off of that scandal, as the news was calling it, he um, started bombing Serbia. He used the opportunity, you know, calling it a, against communist Tito. And to take the daily focus. That's what a lot of the news reports say, to get that focus off the Monica Gate scandal. Uh, let's go do a, a big war, you know, activity, and bomb the blazes out of Serbia, you former Yugoslavia, help create Kosovo. Paul goes on to say, at the time, G German Chancellor Schroeder, 1999, then German Chancellor Sch Schroeder, said that maybe the United States shouldn't be faulted for that, for that, since America was supplying, you know, for not, not informing the rest of the NATO countries and not providing the intelligence and resources. He said since America was supplying 95% of the resources for the Serbia action. And Paul says, I'm pretty sure you never read anything about that in your news over there and the Western news new sources. He, and he went on and said, now, and asked a question. Maybe the United States is contributing to the situation? And to that, I haven't answered Paul yet in an email reply back to him, but Paul, if you're watching, I'm going to, I'm going, in my reply on my email, I plan to say back to you, the United States is definitely, has and is definitely contributing to the situation there, and and more than just in the physical way that's involved. Um, we're contributing by our continuing to disobey our Creator that our forefathers swore before God at Mount Sinai we would do. We would, you be our God, we'll be your people, we will diligently hearken to your voice. We'll obey your commands, your judgments, your statutes, and then immediately run out and disobey. And then God have to put us in captivity, and we cry and repent. Oh, Lord, help us out of this. We're sorry. <clears throat> and then God releases them from captivity, and for a while they obey, but not for too long. Then it's not long before Stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate, rebellious Israel is right back to disobeying God, breaking his commands, his judgments, his statutes, disobeying his voice, 
and sinning all over again. And next time, and he says, you know, he, he'll, he'll do this to us. He'll give us punishments up to seven times. And then he'll break the pride of our power. And if we still refuse to repent from our disobedience to God and his commands, then he says, okay, uh, the prophecies he gave and the warnings of, the, of those things that he said would happen to us through Ezekiel will come about as the fifth seal. The great tribulation opens up, especially chapter 6, verse 6 of Ezekiel, where God says, the ultimate, I will lay waste all of your cities. A prophecy for these end times, because as God's end time apostle well put it, all of the cities of a nation could not have been destroyed before August 1955 when the hydrogen bomb was perfected and tested. The bombs that can be placed on missiles that can be directed to, very pinpointed to a, a city from Europe to a city in the United States, from Europe to a city in Europe's uh, cities of the UK, and lay waste all of the cities of the two modern sons of Joseph, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States. So, yeah, Paul, the answer to the question is that, you know, is the United States uh, possibly contributing to the situation? Oh, definitely, yes. And because God announces in Isaiah chapter 10 and verses 5 and 6 that he will use the Assyrians who today, the modern-day Assyrians, are your people in Germany and Austria. That can be easily traced, the migrations from the Caucasus Mountains show you uh, where the modern-day Assyrians are today. The very same people who held the ten tribes of Israel captive in the mountain range between what is now Georgia and Russia. And, uh, oh, I wish I'd pulled some maps for that up. But I've shown those on World Watch several times. But uh, so, yeah, the answer to that question, of, as Paul was writing, maybe the U.S., the United States of America, is contributing to the situation that is co by which Germany is calling for an EU army. Yes, Paul, I would definitely agree. I know your implication in the question is 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 positive that, yeah, you know, maybe the United States is contributing to the situation. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely by our sins. Um, and a U.S. Army. Now, what I plan to cover just a little bit of tonight, oh, I was going to read you Isaiah 10, verses 5 and 6, if you want to read along with me. Isaiah, just before Jeremiah, we're going to go to chapter 10, and... You know, you have to do you have to do your your facts from history to see and know that the modern day Assyrians today are are in Germany and Austria. N knowing that helps you understand this prophecy in Isaiah 10 verses 5 and 6 and how it relates to today. One more time, God is going to use going to use the Assyrians as he here says here in verse 5 as the rod of mine of mine anger. You know, it's like a father or a dad going out to the peach tree in the backyard or the apple tree or some tree in the backyard, breaking off a branch and coming back in and spanking one of his children for having done wrong or taking off his belt and, or grabbing the old wooden paddle and spanking a child for having, having, done, wrong, having done wrong. God uses the Assyrian when his people do wrong, as he says here, you'll explain it, you'll, you'll see the whole explanation in these two verses, 5 and 6 of Isaiah 10. O Assyrian, modern-day Germans and Assyrians, the, the rod of mine anger are the Germans and the Assyrians, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Then in verse 6, God says, I will send him, he's referring back to the Assyrians, to 
the modern-day Assyrians, Germany and Austria. I'll send the Germans, the Austrians, against an hypocritical nation, against the people of my wrath. Now, I've asked this question many times before, both here on Sabbath service, Sabbath.tv, and also on World Watch TV. I've asked this often. Who are the people of God's wrath? The hypocritical nation he's talking about, except those people today whose forefathers stood before God at Mount Sinai and said, oh, yes, Lord, you be our God. We will be your people and we'll obey, we'll diligently obey your voice, your commandments, your judgments, your statutes, and then run right out and disobey. God says, I'll send the Germans, the Austrians, against a hypocritical nation, against the people of my wrath. Will I give a charge so that the Germans, the Austrians, take the spoil? You know, whenever in war, the victor takes the assets, the spoil, it's called in the Bible, of the, of the loser, and take the prey. Now, the prey in a war situation are the actual people who lose the battle. They're taken prey. They're taken slaves. They're taken captive. And so God says he'll have the Germans, the Austrians, take the modern-day sons of Joseph captive after slaying two-thirds of them, according to Ezekiel. One-third will be killed in the direct hits of the hydrogen bombs. Another third, you know, and that represents the second seal, the red horse of war. Another third, totaling two-thirds now, will be killed from the fallout of the direct hits, from the radiation damaging the water, poisoning the water and the air and the, and the vegetation and the agriculture that grows. And, and again, just being in the air will kill another third of the people a, you know, who become very, very sick from the radiation fallout. And the third who are able to remain alive, God says, as he explains in Ezekiel, like the hairs in the skirt, will be taken captive. But not captive in your home, not captive here in the United States. You'll be hauled off to Europe. Those old Holocaust buildings that have been very well preserved because people want to go see them. They've been preserved with museum money. They'll be used, once again, for the same purpose they were used during World War II, to house people who the Germans will be strategically killing off. But God says 10% of the total of the population will be allowed to live on over into the world tomorrow after Jesus Christ returns, and that's the good news. But uh, did I read the rest of that? Yeah, Oh, the very last part of verse 6 from, Revela from, from Isaiah chapter 10, after saying you'll take, uh, take the spoil, take the prey, take people captive, and to tread them down. This is how the people in captivity will be treated. And to tread them down like the common mud or dirt of the streets. And tread them down or trample upon them. Just treat them with great disdain and kill a lot of them. Um, now, before I go to the uh, next sub the subject I want to cover for tonight, main su subject after mentioning this significant news story from this week and then commenting on it with, with uh, Paul Kiefer's response in an email that I promised I would share with you tonight, uh, I want to let you know that I got this book I ordered a couple of months ago. I ordered, I ordered it from one company, they sent it, and an empty package came. And they refunded my money. It was obvious a book had been in the package, but the post office itself even put a note on the package saying that it was delivered open with no contents. And so I took a picture of that and sent it. I'd ordered it through um, one of the online companies, and I sent it through their request a refund procedure, and it was just hands down automatic. The seller said, okay, we see you didn't get it. And we don't have another book we can send you. Here's your money back. I thought, I'd rather have the book. So I found another company uh, that had the book. And uh, it looks in very brand new condition. I bought it from a thrift store through the online seller. 
they took uh, forever to deliver it to me. It just, it just it finally it just came a few days ago. A book entitled. Uh, well, let's see. Can, can, I wonder if you can see this a little better if we zoom in tighter. Uh, maybe, yeah, you kind of maybe can see this. It's entitled, uh, I don't know if the focus is good enough, but maybe you kind of see it's, it's entitled um, Insane. What's the rest of the title? The, the main title is Insane, and the subtitle is America's Criminal Treatment of Mental Illness. Now, there's a reason on behalf of one of our church members that I ordered this book and have been desiring to receive it. It's written by Elisa Roth, who I heard speaking on public radio maybe two or three months ago. Shortly after I heard her speak, I ordered her book and have finally gotten it uh, because her writing about the subtitle, America's Criminal Treatment of Mental Illness, relates to what's happened here in Alabama. Before I tell you that, I'm going to remind some of you who know this already of how one of Mr. Herbert Armstrong's, God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong, his, one of his um, highly trusted on his behalf, a man he had put a lot of trust in, a man who had tremendously helped him in many ways as his legal counselor, and had been, had been, I can't even find the word that describes how helpful Stan Rader was during the time of the California attempt to take over the church because of some dissident members, including one of them was Mr. Armstrong, one of Mr. Armstrong's own sons who encouraged that encouraged those six dissidents who came up with a lawsuit that the California state acted upon to put a res to attempt and for a little while they did have a receiver come in trying to take over and run the church but God inspired Mr. Armstrong's legal counsel with great wisdom to have asked the members to send the tithe monies to, instead of to uh, a normal corporation under the name of Worldwide Church of God, to corporate souls, corporation souls that Mr. Rader had set up for Mr. Armstrong, and he set them up in each and every state of the union, and had it be mailed to the state of Arizona, where Mr. Armstrong was living, which took any new money outside of California, which meant the California state deceiver or receiver then legally had no ability to attach those that the, the, the new funding coming in, you know, ties and offerings coming to Mr. Armstrong. So from Arizona, he was able to keep the broadcast, the telecast running, it just moved headquarters to Arizona instead of operating from California until the court system in California and the deceiver himself decided to pack up his bags and, and get out of there. Oh, no new money coming in. How are you going to pay me? You know, and um, how am I going to run this operation without money to pay these bills coming in here? He saw pretty quickly, whoops, we've been licked. And Mr. Armstrong's legal counsel, Mr. Rader, was outstanding in that maneuver and uh, but unfortunately similar to um, to Judah uh, he became very disloyal in, in his ability to, in smarts he came up with this idea to to help a woman that Mr. Armstrong had married who wanted to divorce and take over as much many assets as they could to have Mr. Armstrong designated as senile and put into locked into a mental institution. Some of you don't know this, but this actually happened. And I got in big trouble in Jerusalem. Some of you've heard me tell the story before because uh you know, look, I've already mentioned the name, so let's just call it straight across the board. Mr. Rader thought that I knew what they were up to because I was close to members of his family. I'd been in his home, would be in his home a lot for about a year 
while I was dating one of his daughters. And um, he thought I knew what they were going to do when they got back from Israel, back into the United States. Well, I did. I had no idea. Uh, and I didn't initiate the conversation with Mr. Armstrong. I was in the hotel, a hotel in Jerusalem, the Hilton Hotel, for several weeks before Mr. Armstrong arrived over. I was working with the, uh, what do you call it, the, the dig, the, the, the dig over there in, in Israel um, during the fall. I stayed over for a couple of months in Israel. I had a, I had a business of my own. I was operating the business from from Israel, I had eight people work for me back here in the United States, and I just talked to them on the phone every day. And uh, so one morning I'm down, I was eating most of my breakfast is, uh, and lunch in the hotel, especially on Friday. On Friday I'd prepare for the Sabbath and I wouldn't go up and do the dig. And so Mr. Armstrong flies in with his crew, Mr. Rader, Aaron Dean was assisting then, flew in with them. Television crew, I remember some of the people I used to work with in television my first two years in college. The television crew was there. and uh, But I didn't see any of them while I'm having lunch. It's a big, big lunch cafeteria or lunch uh, uh, restaurant in the Hilton Hotel in Jerusalem. Until I've finished eating, Mr. Armstrong has finished eating, I walk out into the lobby area. Mr. Armstrong walked out. Now, he was by himself when he walked out, even though Stan Rader, Henry Cornwall were over on the other side. And I guess Aaron and I remember the television crew. I saw them while Mr. Armstrong and I were talking. They weren't filming us or anything. But as I turned, as we were talking, I see, oh, there's Stan Rader. There's Henry Cornwall. I didn't see Aaron right away. There was uh, some of the fellows I used to work with in the television studio, they were over there, but they all stood back because they saw Mr. Armstrong uh, summon me. He was, he was. I don't know why everybody left him by himself. Maybe that's just his own doing. Whatever. But he's, he's over here, and as I come walking out, he's standing there, and I look and I see him. He sees me, and he speaks first. He says, hello, Stephen. You know, and, it, and he kind of like summons me over. And so I, I kind of... Uh, of course, I go over. I was excited and glad to see him and was surprised, you know, and like. Um, and he immediately launches into telling me how, I, you've, some of you heard me tell this before, how he had just written the entire personal for one of the magazines, whether it was The Plain Truth or The Good News, I forget, you know, or maybe even personal for the Worldwide News, but whichever, it was the personal. I remembered him. I remember him saying that. And he was excited about this new invention. This, at the time, it had just come out, what they then called facsimile machines. We now, most people call them fax machines today. We call, you know, fax, F-A-X, standing for facsimile machine is the whole name of it. He was excitedly telling me how they, he had one that he carried with him. And, and it was quite brand new. I'd heard about them. I knew what they were. Um, and you would take, and it was, and cell phones weren't out then, and you, so you'd take the cradle of your telephone, in the, which he would do in the hotel room, and place it on the, place the telephone handset on the cradle of the fax machine that he carried with him. And he, he was excitedly telling me how he was able to put what he typed up on his manual typewriter there in the, uh, well, I think he might have plugged it in, but, you know, still manual like typewriter, not a computer. Um, in his hotel room, and he had put it on this new little fandangled fax machine, facsimile machine. He called it the whole name, facsimile machine. And he was able to transmit that through that little machine like a copy machine, he said, like making a photocopy in a copy machine. They get it on the other end in Pasadena immediately after he's, you know, it takes a minute or so to roll through there. The old ones were slower. He said, and as soon as it rolls through there, they've got it in Pasadena. And he says, then they take it, and in 20 minutes, they retypeset it and put it back on the fax mach facsimile machine, and he gets a copy back in his hotel room, completely typeset by the publishing department in Pasadena. And he said, you know, I've already got it back, already seen it, everything looked good, and blah, blah, blah. He's just excitedly telling me about this, you know, and blah, 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 blah. Well, uh, like I said, Henry Cornwall and Stan Rader were on the opposite side of the lobby, some distance away, though, you know. And um, 
I get a knock on my door <clears throat> later in the afternoon. Uh, my old college friend, we were in the class of 74 Pasadena together, and and uh, I had become good friends with, with Aaron. He was with traveling with Mr. Armstrong as his assistant. I get a knock on my door. At the time, I'm on the phone with my office in California, the people that work for me. I was... I was, it was starting their morning at the time I was talking to them in the afternoon. It was, was the beginning of the day. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure that the business is making good money so it could pay my, pay my bills at the hotel in Jerusalem and my dining and everything else. And, yeah, and the business was doing well, but I needed to keep them instructed. Things I would normally do while I'm there, I was having other people do and, you know, cover, and I had to explain some things to them. Aaron talks to my door and says, Stephen, Stan Rader wants to see you right away downstairs in the lobby. And I'm, I'm holding the phone. I say, uh, will, Stan, uh, will Aaron tell Mr. Rader uh, I'll see him in about a half hour? And Aaron looked rather urgent about it and said, he wants to see you right now. And I, I said, well, I said, look, Aaron, I, I'm on the phone with my business in California. You know, I'm not part of your tour here. I'm not part of, I don't work for the work right now, uh, except I would sometimes teach some dance classes and but I, I mainly was had my business I'm not part of the I'm not part of your travel tourage I'm, I'm you know I'm here I have my own business and I'm on the phone with my office in California tell please tell Mr. Rader that you know so I said well I'll, I'll hurry it up tell him I'll see him in 20 minutes and Aaron looked a little disappointed but he said okay I said Aaron I'm a, I gotta talk my business so uh, 20 minutes later, I go downstairs to the lobby, and um, Mr. Rader says, uh, I want to know everything you said to Mr. Armstrong. And I, I thought, wait a second, I can't think of everything I said to Mr. Armstrong. I can't even think. At the moment, when you get hit like that, and I had been talking about my business, and my, I have a one-track mind. My frame of mind was on something else. And, uh, brother, this relates. This relates to, this, to what we're going to go into next. And it relates to and it relates to why I bought this book to help out one of our brethren in the church, uh, and it makes an emphatic and a good point about how an evil about putting people into mental institutions and locking them up can be done too easily in several states in the United States, and you should watch out against that even yourself. Mr. Rader had a plan to do that against Mr. Armstrong when they got back to the United States to Arizona. Their plan was to have Mr. Armstrong taken to a doctor and then be, you know, they pay that doctor big money and have him diagnosed based on his wife signing a thing saying that he's senile and getting the doctor to verify it, and him not even being allowed to leave, being immediately locked up in a mental ward and being designated as senile and mentally deficient. And... Um, and that can be done too easily, especially in the state of Arizona, where Mr. Armstrong was living, altogether too easily. And just like has happened here in Alabama, that's been done to one of our sisters in Alabama by her own family, her unconverted family, had her locked up in a mental institution. And I, where I used to go hold Sabbath services with her every week, I've been even prevented. The family has said her minister can't see her. I can't even go see her now. And in fact, when I tried to for Passover, they called the police and had me um, barred from even setting foot on the property under threat of arrest for trespass. And that's a one-year bar. So I can't even step onto the property for one year at, at the location where Cat is. Some people ask me from time to time, hey, how's Cat? I'm not allowed to visit her. I write letters to her. Um, I don't even know if those letters are being read to her, I, and I, I, I get zero response. They don't let her write back. They don't write me back, and that's the way the situation is there on that with Kat, and that's why I've ordered this book. And this is how, and, and what I'm telling you now about the story in Jerusalem relates to Kat being locked up in a mental institution because Mr. Rader had planned to do that against Mr. Armstrong. Uh, and... I was informed by Aaron, after Aaron got wind of what they were attempting to do, that Mr. Rader thought I was telling Mr. Armstrong about their plan because he thought I knew it, and Henry Cornwall had told him, 
had told Mr. Ritter he overheard Stephen telling Mr. Armstrong about their plan to take him to the doctor when they get back to the state. I didn't even know they were going to do that, so there's no way I could have, unless I would have made it up, and why, why would I have made up a story I didn't know anything about? You know, how could I match it unless I knew it? And I didn't. Uh, he was just telling me about his fax, fax machine. Well, at the moment Mr. Rader was caught, you know, asked me the question when I came downstairs and caught me off guard and asked me, you know, I want to know everything you said to Mr. Armstrong. I'm thinking, I didn't even say that much to Mr. Armstrong. He's telling me about his facsimile machine. But I didn't explain that to Mr. Rader because at the moment I'm thinking about my business. I still needed to go back and talk more to my, I cut it short. I kept it to 20 minutes like I told Aaron and came on down. I still needed to go back upstairs and get back on the phone with my office in, 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 in uh, California. Let's see, what was the city? Pacific Palisades is where it was located at the time. Anyway, uh, where our office was. And uh, so when Mr. Armstrong, so when Mr. Rader said, uh, I don't know everything you said to Mr. Armstrong, I said, uh, and that you all talked about. I said, uh, well, Stan, I think you better buy me a drink. <laughs> and so I ordered something, and I, I drank the drink there, and I, I, I'm talking to him about anything and everything else that I can think of, you know, and at the time I'm thinking, you know, how do I, how do I answer that question? And I'm, I'm, I felt like uh, I was on a criminal uh, inquiry the way Mr. I'm, the way Mr. Raider was, you know, he was there, his wife was there with her, Nikki was there with him, and, the, and we're in the lobby, and it's just them and I, me, I think Aaron wasn't there with us, just them and me. And I'm like, you know, boom. And I'm saying, okay, you better buy me a drink. I had a drink. And uh, and then when he says, uh, when he asked me again after we talked about a bunch of other stuff for a while, he said, I want to know everything y'all talked about. And I just said it matter-of-factly, not angrily, not uh, not meaning to be fisticuff. I just said, uh, well, Mr. Rader, I don't think that's any of your business, what we talked about. And... Um, now, you know, I admit I might have been wrong to have answered him that way. He had been made an evangelist. Maybe I wasn't showing enough respect for his office. But I also did feel like the way he was doing it was not like a minister, but more like, like an attorney and a criminal inquiry. And, and I thought, you know, if I had been talking to him about something personal as if to a minister, that would have been private between us. That wouldn't be anybody else's business. And in part, when I said, Mr. Rader, I don't really think that's any of your business, I was really stating a principle that I think should be involved between a council, between a, you know, a minister and a, and a, and a, and a brethren. Um, and, you know, I thought, that's, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't think that's any of your business. And uh, he said, you are persona non gratis, our group. Now, I'd already been invited by Aaron to, I'd been told Aaron had seen me in between that morning and said, hey, Stephen, Mr. Armstrong welcomes you to the Bible study in his room, hotel room tonight. So I'd already been invited, but now all of a sudden I'm made persona not gratis. And at the time Mr. Rader said that to me, I had not been working in law offices. I had no legal background whatsoever. Wasn't that familiar with Latin, although we had a little Latin in my junior high school, but I'd never heard that term before. Maybe some of you haven't heard that. I, maybe you have. But I didn't have any idea what that term meant. And for a moment, I'll tell you the truth, except for the tone of voice, for a moment, I thought, oh, maybe he's, maybe he knows I'm invited to the Bible study, and so I'm persona non gratis. That maybe that means something good or nice. But I, I kind of thought, I don't think so. I, I need to go look that. And I didn't want to ask him, what does that mean, Mr. Rader? I thought, he just made a final, a, kind of like a final statement. And I don't know whether he got up and left or what. But uh, after he said that, that was really like curtain. This was the end of our conversation. And uh, when I got upstairs, I got on the phone and had some people look up persona non gratis for me. I said, hey, would you mind looking at the call my office? What, hey, would you guys somehow look up? Uh, get, get, find what does the term persona non gratis mean? Well, it means you're, you know, you are axed, you're cut from the group. Now, he didn't formally disfellowship me at that moment, but he told Aaron Dean, who came and told me later, he said, Stephen, Mr. Rader just told me next time he sees you, he has announced that he's going, he hasn't done it yet, but next time he sees you, 
he's going to disfellowship you, and you know he's an evangelist now. I said, uh-oh, <laughs> and I must have made him kind of angry or something. I thought, yikes. That's right. All right. I knew that meant I wasn't invited to the Bible study anymore, and if Mr. Rader was going to be there, he was going to announce me disfellowshipped, and, you know, and inquiry would have been made later, not then, and so I would have just been out, out the door, and and because he had seemed to have a lot of control on things, uh, you know, I, I thought the best idea was uh, for me to not be seen by Mr. Rader again. So when Aaron told me that, I said, uh, I, I don't know if I called Aaron on the phone later or what, but I, uh, I told Aaron, I'm going to... I'm going to change rooms. I said, I'm going to let you know, you know, what's your room number? And uh, I'll call you and let you know where I am. But I said, uh, I'm going to change my room number. And uh, I want you to let Mr. Rader know where I am until I leave the hotel. And Aaron agreed. And I went into an immediate three-day fast because of that. And um, I let Aaron know what I was doing, too. And Aaron would bring me th things that, Pasadena Publishing would send over to Mr. Armstrong to look at and approve on his new fax machine, one of which was the Worldwide News. I told you this the other day. Some of you probably heard me say this three or four times, but it led to something kind of good because one of the articles by Gene Hogberg was in that current issue of the Worldwide News while this event was going on that Aaron had brought to me, you know, to allow me to read <clears throat> that Mr. Armstrong had already read and approved everything, so now it was just you know, toss it out, give it to Stephen. <laughs> I saw that Mr. Uh, uh, World Watch, uh, Mr. Mr. Hogberg had written that the crown of the Holy Roman Empire would be on display in the royal treasury in Vienna uh, this week, you know, that the current week. In fact, it's on display all the time there now, actually. And I... Uh, during, and I got that during my three-day fast, and I uh, prayed, and I asked God, I said, God, hey, what about me going seeing that? And it just seemed like a glowing, wonderful idea, because during my fasting, I was feeling desperate. I was feeling like, God, I got an evangelist wanting the next time he sees me, tell me I'm disfellowshipped. And that was not a comfortable feeling at all. I was distraught by it, to tell you the truth. So I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible, I'm saying, God, what do I do? You know, how am I, how, how and why am I in such trouble? Except maybe I was a little smart aleck or something. I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I'm saying, you know, Lord, help me out of this, please. And uh, Aaron shows me, and I was very comforted by Aaron's constantly coming to see me in between their going, doing whatever they would be doing. And uh, and then when I saw that, it was like an answer to the prayer. It was like, go do this. You know, I'm still with you, Stephen. I, the Father, I am still with you, even though you got some trouble here. Uh, go see this crown of the Holy Roman Empire. Well, you know, let me see if you're interested in that. Yeah, I was very interested in that. That sounded delightful. So I got on the phone, made arrangements for taking a plane and booked my plane from Israel to France, because from France, from a location I flew to in France, which I think was Marseille, I was able to take a train uh, through Germany, and it'd be like a two or three day trip, which just really took the 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 pressure, the um, the bad feeling of what had just happened in Jerusalem with Mr. Rader. It took the edge. It took the bad edge off of that by traveling through beautiful country in France, beautiful country in Germany. The trains go through some of the most beautiful scenic routings and places. And, take time. and I love train travel anyway, and especially European train travel. So it was, it was a, a comforting, warming trip after, after a very bad thing over in Israel and uh, with Mr. Radar, Mr. Rader. And, uh, and so I get to Vienna, and I'm able to not only see the crown of the Holy Roman Empire, but there was no guard in the room at the time uh, I took my pictures, obeying the signs that said you can't use flash. And then as I complained to one of the guards on the way out, I said, hey, I had a sign in the room that says you can't use flash for taking a picture of the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. He says, you can't take a picture of that at all. You know, if we see you taking a picture of that, we'll confiscate your camera. And I, I thought, well, the way he worded that, I said, well, to myself, I said, 
I didn't say this out loud, but to myself, I said, well, I'm sure glad he didn't see me taking the picture. I, I pressed my camera up. It's thick glass, the cap, the cage in which the crown of the Holy Roman in, in, Empire is encased is thick glass, strong, thick glass. So I pressed my camera up hard against the thick glass, turned off the flash, and opened up a time exposure, and I must have taken, I must have taken two dozen pictures at several different exposure settings, you know, like uh, tenth of a second, two tenths of a second, half a second, one full second, two full seconds, and all kind of times in between and different exposures, F2 and F2.4 and 4 and 8 and 16, whatever all the different settings were. You know, I was, this was not an electronic digital camera, so you couldn't immediately see your, your picture in a little TV screen like you can do today. This was old 35 millimeter slide film, and you don't get to see what, what you got until you develop the film. So I took enough pictures hoping one of them would come out. I got two great shots of that crown of the Holy Roman Empire. Occasionally, I show that crown to you here on on one of our uh, slides, and uh, it really exists. That crown really exists. Let's take a moment. I will. I'll back that up, and let's see where would I find that. Hang on. I'm going to roll forward to that crown, and then I'll open the shot up. Um, I'll go ahead and open up the shot. It's coming up, and right. Oop. Oh, yeah. Right here. In this picture, at the bottom row middle, there's a picture of the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. As I put three missiles, I layered three missiles over it coming out of the center of the crown to illustrate that the next thing we're watching for, the next time this crown will be worn, will be during round three of World War which will be commenced when the fifth seal is opened up. And when the fifth seal opens, the Great Tribulation, that's when the beast will be announced. That's when the Pope will fly over to Frankfurt, Ger Germany, fly or travel or, you know, drive, however, with a stop perhaps in, in Vienna first to grab this, this, this crown from the royal treasury in Vienna and take it over to Frankfurt, Germany, to the second floor of the Romer building, where... Uh, historically, the, the the representative of the, of the Vatican, the Pope, has always flown, has always uh, held the coronation ceremonies when they crown a new emperor of a, of the Holy Roman Empire. They'll take that crown on the bottom row down there in the middle. They'll take that crown and put it on the head of the new dictator, emperor of a revived Holy Roman Empire for its seventh and final time. It'll be that exact crown right there, pictured right there in the middle on the bottom row that you can see with your own eyeballs, even right now, still in that same cabinet, cage, glass cabinet, uh, big prominent in the middle of the room. Thick, you you know, you, you won't break that without making a lot of noise. And they had plenty of guards around there. It just so happens at the time I was taking my picture of it, uh, there weren't any guards in the room. And... I was able to walk out of there with pictures of that of that crown. And you can go see it yourself, as I said. It still exists, and it will. That's the very throne that will be carried over to the Kaiser's Hall. The Kaiser's Hall is located on the second floor of the Romer building in Frankfurt, Germany. Kaiser's Hall is the German wording for Emperor's Hall, where they crown the past kings and emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. The empire is in the, in the, it's dormant, it's in the pit, it's in the abyss at the moment, but it's prophesied to rise again, to be restored, revived one more time as the seventh dynasty of the Holy Roman Empire under a seventh king who, if we back up these slides or advance them one, I have this scripture. I'll pull this forward just real quickly. Uh, this scripture points out, Revelation 17, verse 10, there are seven kings. We've seen six of them come and go. Now, when the Apostle John wrote this in 90 AD from the Isle of Patmos, it was uh, a future perfect prophecy saying there are seven kings. They haven't even been born yet when he wrote that, but there would be seven kings. And after there were five of them, there would be a time period when five of them are fallen 
and one, and then there would be a time period when, well, that could be the same time period. After five were fallen, one is. Now, that time period where there was one is was only between 1935 and 1945. April, uh, the fall of 35 to the spring of 45, nine and a half years, when Mussolini was wearing the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. Symbolically, he was. He was. He had announced himself as Il Duce, the new Roman emperor, the new Ju Julius Caesar, he said, Il Duce. And he announced that he had revived the Holy Roman Empire. God inspired Mr. Armstrong to see and understand that that was a fulfillment of this verse, the part of this verse that says, and one is. That was during Mr. Armstrong's heyday, part of his heyday, from 1935 to 1945 when he was broadcasting and he announced, Mussolini has fulfilled this verse, the one is, is here. But he goes on to where we are today to say, and the other is not yet come. The other that's not yet come is the seventh and final king who will wear this crown on the bottom row, middle, middle of the bottom row, the picture there of the crown of the Holy Roman Empire, will wear that for the seventh and final time before Christ returns. And that's what we're watching for now. That's why we're watching news the way we watch it Sunday through Thursday night on World Watch. And uh, now that crown and the institution of the seventh king for that crown will restore the Holy Roman Empire, which will branch off of a United States of Europe that is whittled to Ten leaders giving their power to this seventh king, to this beast, as the Bible calls it, um, with the false prophet, the representative from the Vatican, the Pope, um, working in consort with the beast, uh, working in consort, kind of like we have uh, on this picture over here on, uh, on this side, far wall. If we go over, let's see, what would that be? That's screen number from left to right, one, two, three, four. That's screen number four, if I can get the right button. Yeah, we'll, uh, the woman that you see riding this beast represents the false prophet. And uh, she is controlling the beast. And the beast itself is that head with those iron teeth that you see there, and that the ten crowns on this beast. Now, this is the beast from the land, the land beast. Not the beast from the ocean, but the beast from the land that's mentioned in Revelation 13, chapter 13. And the beast from the land is the one ridden by uh, the false prophet that who's represented by that woman, you see, holding up the, the drinking cup filled with the bloods of the saints. And the ten horns on this beast are the ten concurrent leaders of a United States of Europe that give their power to that one head. So the 27 remaining um, countries of the EU, if it continues to be the EU that, that, um, that functionalizes, you know, this, this and opens the fifth seal and gives their power to the beast, will then be whittled down to 10 liters. Maybe they'll regionalize it or something. But we'll see that happen before our very eyes. That'll happen in the news, maybe slowly, maybe overnight. And then we'll see it announced who that leader will be, and then we'll be able to, very likely, we'll be able to watch the news of the Pope grabbing that crown in Vienna, traveling to Frankfurt with it, holding a coronation ceremony that may be televised worldwide and placing it on the head of perhaps one of the heirs of some of the former uh, some of the former emperors of the Holy Roman Empire and there are heirs of those uh, former emperors alive today in fact uh, here's one of them right here that we're watching uh, because he's a candidate to be uh, I'll pull him in a little closer he is a candidate to possibly be the new 
Beast, the new uh, head of a uh, revived Holy Roman Empire. And uh, let me see, there's some others we're watching. Let's, do I have those photographs here? Well, no, Mr. Armstrong is not one of the ones we're watching to possibly become the beast. I don't have the other photographs here on the screen. We are watching this fellow, Frank Walter Steinmeier. Um, in my book, he's a candidate, even though he's not an heir of, um, of uh, any former uh, uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. But he, he's a candidate. And um, But the one I just showed you, uh, this fellow here, is more likely candidate. Um, all right, but friends, I need, if we're going to do this and still be within the 90 minutes for a Bible study, I need to move to the subject that I had for us for tonight that relates to what is the EU. Uh, just a brief subject. I was going to do this on World Watch the other day, but we... Uh, we ran out of time. And talk about time. One of the news stories this week uh, announced that uh, the bureau that sets the doomsday clock is keeping the clock at two minutes to midnight, as same as it was last year. You know, they've moved the time all over the place. During one of the news reports, in fact, I think it was Thursday night, we gave this story from the current news about after they had announced that they were setting, keeping the clock at two minutes to midnight, as same as last year, I put up a chart in the news uh, report of this that showed uh, at various times and years where they have moved that time to doomsday all over the place. And one year they had it 17 minutes to midnight, and 15 minutes, and 10 minutes, and 13 minutes, and 12. They moved it. They've moved it back and forth. They, they, if things cool off instead of being two minutes to midnight they'll make it five minutes or ten minutes to midnight but it where they are right now it, they consider this a very dangerous two minutes to midnight they consider a very dangerous level based on several factors which include the amount of um, nuclear pro proliferation the amount of nuclear hydrogen bombs and missiles that countries have stockpiled they can be fired against one another and especially fired against the United States. And the, with the way it is today and the number they have, they decided to keep it at two minutes to midnight. And that was announced uh, Wednesday or Thursday this week. This week was announced this week. They're keeping it at two minutes to midnight. So that's why I made a graphic based on their, their graphic showing two minutes to midnight. All right, now. Um, let's see, and I <clears throat> I wanted to cover, now before I do that, because we're going to probably need to exit real quickly when we go, I'm going to back this up to where we have our outgoing music for the Bible study and just have that ready so when I have to say goodnight, we can just say goodnight and go. And um, then here, I'll back these up so I can go through a few slides that relate to what is the EU? And um, <clears throat> the, from Wikipedia, it explains that the, the European Union, the EU, is, as they define it, a political and economic union consisting of 28 member states that are subject to the to the obligations and the privileges, it says, of the membership. Now, as you know, that 28 members is going to be whittled down to 27 if, in fact, Britain exits on March 29 this year, 2019. Um, let me get that out of the way, that lower third. At the very bottom of this picture of the flags of the countries of the EU, the bottom in the bottom middle section down there are two of the most current uh well the, the, the most current member was came in in 2013 was it croatia they have the flag with the uh red white and blue and a horizontal stripes and then a shield on top of the red white and blue uh, you can see on the bottom toward the middle and 
Next to that, the flag you see with the red, white, and green horizontal stripe, and next to that, then the flag with the vertical stripes of blue, gold, and red, or blue, yellow, red, whichever they call that. Those are your two flags of, of Bulgaria and Romania. And uh, Mr. Armstrong did tell me one time that he said, Stephen, when you see those two come into uh, the common market, you know, which has expanded into the EU, <clears throat> we, and they came in on January 1, 2007. Of course, that they came in, uh, what would that have been, 21 years after Mr. Armstrong died. Mr. Armstrong had, had said to me, he said, Stephen, when you see those two come into the common market, he said, know that, he said, really keep your eye on things. Things are about, they're going to wrap. Uh, those two need to come into it. Now, I wish I'd have been smart enough to have asked him some questions and say, hey, tell me more about exactly why you're saying that. So all I've got is that little bit I gave you, and so we watch it and learn as much as we can about them to figure out why Mr. Armstrong said that and what, what his thinking was. But uh, the thing is ready to wrap, and those after, where's England's flag? It's in there somewhere. Uh, after they, After England comes out, and there's only 27 flags left here. Well, there's, 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 in the middle of the top is the flag of the European Union itself, and that's something interesting. We'll come back to the definition in a moment. Further definition of the uh, of the of, of the EU. But I, uh, but this this graphic of the flag. Oh, let's see. Actually, there's no recording going on. I need to take that strip off the top. But let me just bring this forward. Get that out of the way. Not that one. This one, Stephen. Um, oh yeah, I didn't. All right, that recording thing is still there. Let's see, do I have? Let me, let me. I can get that out of the way by going to this shot here. Yeah. Okay. There we go. You notice there's 12 stars in the European flag. <clears throat> now I haven't found an official reasoning for this, but my own thinking and praying about it is okay, Father. Eventually, it's going to be whittled down to 10 leaders who give their power to one dictator, emperor, so that would make 11 of them. Why are they at 12 stars? Oh, yeah, remember, not only is there a beast, but there's a false prophet. And so if that's what this symbolically could mean, here we've got a situation where we've got, um, uh, let me see if I can come back to this shot right here. Uh, we've got, uh, actually, I wanted to do it this way. Let's see, what happens if I do this shot? Okay. Oh, I see. We're just, it doesn't change it. Okay. Um, we got a situation where we've got 10 leaders who are going to give their power to one beast who's going to be crowned by a false prophet. So that totals 12. That, that's my reasoning is to, for me thinking, why they got 12 stars in that thing? So I've, I've satisfied myself with saying, okay, there's 10 leaders give their power to one beast, and riding that one beast is the false prophet. So that's 12 players involved in the ultimate thing that becomes the United States of Europe that that can bring forth the this that can open up the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation, and the commencement of round three of World War with a uh, seventh king and a false prophet, a seventh king restoring the Holy Roman Empire for the seventh dynasty and its final its final restoration, final revision, final reviving out of the abyss, out of the pit, out of the out of the state of dormancy. Um, and let me go back to that flag. I like those flags better for this for what we're doing. Um, where did I put those flags? They're there. Uh, now the open the definition in Wikipedia of what is the European Union, it says it's a political an economic union. And God's end-time apostle, Herbert Armstrong, has explained that there would be four unions necessary for the revision, for the final restoration and reviving from the pit, that, that seventh and final Holy Roman Empire. Um, there would be four unions necessary. 
the present definition in Wikipedia of the European Union is two of those unions, a political union and economic union. It actually began the other way, with an economic union first, beginning in 1950, with uh, a, an econo a common market. Let me see, I've got a slide that relates to that. Yeah, in fact, let's see. Here's a slide from 1957 showing the first six countries to join into the, uh, the EU. The reason I don't like having that lever up there on top. Let's see, can I get rid of that with this? Yeah, except ah, we lost our, uh, hang on a second, we lost our closed captions for those who are hard of hearing. Let me see if I can figure out what button I need to punch to bring that in. Um, 48. Okay, if I add display 48 on this one over here, hang with me a second. Let's see, that's 32. Change 32 to 48. Hang on a second. I can put that right here. I think oh, it needs to be sized. Eh. Let's see if I can size it real quick. All right, this may not work the way I wanted it to. Um, I may have to live with that. Yeah, I tell you what, because of the shortness of time we have especially, let me live with that bar being there that I really don't want to see there, but um, at, least, at least the closed captions are okay this way. All right, now... There are the six original countries. You notice it does not include the UK. It doesn't include Great Britain. Um, it doesn't include uh, Ireland, Denmark. Uh, that happens later. That happens in 1973 when Great Britain, Ireland, and Denmark join into um, this common market arrangement. That's when they came in. And let me come back with you here for a moment because... Uh, my Wikipedia X definition may cover some of what I'm trying to trying to put across to you. All right, let me take it from the top. Now I said there's four unions necessary. <clears throat> the uh, from the current news this week, German Chancellor Angela Merkel is talking about the third union necessary, calling for a European army to become part of the EU. And that's three of the four things Mr. Armstrong, God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong said would be necessary for this beast to be able to spring open. So they're putting the third one underway already. You'd need an economic union, a political union, a military union, and the fourth one would be a religious union. And that's when the Vatican will get formally involved, send a representative, its pope, over to hold the coronation ceremony and crown the seventh and final king, Revelation 17, 10, seventh king, who becomes the beast of this revived, restored, brought alive again, Holy Roman Empire, for, again, its seventh and final time, for these end times. <clears throat> so there are your four unions necessary. It started out as an economic union in 1950, a European economic common market and then it grew into with the Treaty of Rome it grew into a political union and then with more members coming into it as in uh, throughout the years it grew to where now it's got 28 members before Britain comes out of it uh, so and in 2007 that's when those two countries, Mr. Armstrong said, watch when these two come in. They came in on the two of them together, and only those two, on January 1, 2007, Romania, Bulgaria. And then Croatia came in, and do I have that slide? They came in, Croatia came in in 2013 and uh, totaled it up to 28. <clears throat> now, uh, Britain comes out, a few more are scheduled to go in. At some point, it's going to shape around to where you're only going to be counting 10 leaders for some kind of European um, union, politically, economically, militarily. 
And since the German Chancellor is calling for a, an EU army, she's setting the stage for it to have three of the unions necessary. And it'll reshape to have ten leaders. They'll vote on one. Then the religious union, bringing in the Vatican, the Catholic Church, will seal, will uh, complete the four unions necessary. And that'll probably happen quick. Because like Jesus Christ said in the, verse 35 of Luke 21, this great tribulation, this opening of the fifth seal, comes upon the world as a snare, meaning it comes suddenly, unexpectedly, upon all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth. The King James Version renders its coming upon tout le monde, everybody in the world, unexpectedly, like a snare, like an animal being caught in a trap. If an animal knew the trap was there, he's going to step around it. He's not going to step into it and be caught. He gets caught off guard. That's what Christ says the world happens to the world. It comes like a snare, catching the world unawares. And, a, and the whole world, he says, upon all them, A-L-L, -L, all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth. Just to be sure, I'm reading that to you exactly correctly. If you want to follow along, we just got four minutes left. I've got to be real quick. Luke 21, verse 35. Luke 21, verse 35, it says, Christ says here, for as a, and he's just been describing the great tribulation, which in verse 34, he said, take heed to yourselves. Well, he's saying, watch your own conduct too in verse 34, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, overeating, gluttony, and drunkenness, and cares of this life. And he means all of that physically and spiritually, so that that day comes on you unawares, and that day he's just been talking about the fifth seal. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So that's tout le monde, everyone. And then he says in the next verse 36, therefore watch and pray always so that you don't get caught off guards and so that you can be accounted worthy. Two wonderful things. One, to escape all that's going to happen next beginning with that fifth seal, great tribulation through the year-long day of the Lord, and be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man in the first resurrection. you got to be doing these two prerequisites for both of those. Not just keeping the commandments, you've also got to watch and pray always to be accounted worthy for the first resurrection. That's what Christ says in verse 36. And he also says that you can be accounted worthy to escape what's happening in between Christ's return on the seventh trump of the seventh seal, which includes the great two and a half years of the great tribulation, then the heavenly signs, and then the year-long day of the Lord. Christ, God pouring out his punishment upon mankind in four winds, the first four trumps, then in three woes, the last three trumps, fifth, sixth, seventh trump. Christ returning on the seventh trump, bringing seven vials with him, and pouring out the seven last plagues. There's your 777. And uh, let me read the rest of this from Wikipedia real quick, and then I've got to say good night till in the morning, because our 90 minutes just about up in a couple minutes. The European Union, EU, is a political and economic union consisting of 28 member states that are subject to the obligations and privileges of the membership. Every member state is part of the founding treaties of the union, and is subjected to binding laws within the common legislative and judicial institutions. If, if the UK could simply Brexit, no deal, a no deal Brexit, they wouldn't be subject to these laws of the EU. As it is now, if they take Prime Minister Theresa May's deal, she's, that deal makes them subject to EU law, subject to the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, jurisdiction and the trade policy law or rulings of the EU, making the UK be as if it were a subservient colony of the EU when, it's a, when it becomes a non-member. But it says in order for the EU to adopt policies that concern defense and foreign affairs, all member states must agree unanimously. It actually would be better for the UK to leave to stay in than to leave with a bad deal that makes them subject to EU law where they can't vote on it? 
because as a member, if they stayed in, they could mess up the unanimous voting of everybody by always voting the opposite. And they'd make the rest of them want to want the UK. Just go ahead with our blessing and leave. You don't even have to pay us a divorce settlement, no payoff money, nothing. What, what are, and tell us what you want. Just get out of here. You're messing us up. <laughs> anyway, friends, we're out of time. That's a little bit of a summary of the uh, of the EU. Uh, we'll talk about that again. I got more things I could tell you and show you about it, but our time's up. We better honor this clock. Two minutes to midnight, they announced this week on the Doomsday Clock. And friends, that's our Bible study for this uh, Friday night for the 20th day of the 11th month on God's sacred calendar. Friday night, the 25th day of January 2019. God willing, we'll be back here on Sabbath.tv on the Sabbath service page of Facebook Live in the morning for Sabbath services. Hope you have a good, wonderful, pleasant night of sleep. And until next time, friends, this is uh, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth saying Shabbat Shalom, good night, and happy, happy Sabbath to you. Good night, brother.